What's happening guys? Welcome back to another live cash game vlog. We are back at the win again for some more 510 action. And again, we have everybody putting on the $20 straddle. So we're playing 510-20 with $50 bomb pots every dealer change. So a few hands in, we see under the gun raised to 50, the hijack calls, the button who is a middle-aged gentleman drinking wine calls, and we look down at Ace King suited in the small blind. Obviously a great spot to squeeze. There's a few players in already, so I decide to make it $300 to go. The blinds in the straddle quickly get out of the way, as does the original razor. The hijack decides to call and the button gets out of the way, so we go heads up. Flop comes 983 Rainbow. Not the greatest of boards for Ace King, especially without a spade, so we don't have a backdoor flush draw. In terms of continuing, I do think betting or checking is fine. Looking at this spot in 100 big blind cash games, I know the EV of bet or check is similar, and without backdoor flush draw, I think it leads towards checking. So we go ahead and check. Villain checks back, and we see the Queen of Spades on the turn. I go for the check again. I'm not sure if fire in here is going to fold out many hands that we're behind to. Maybe some low pocket pairs like fours and fives. So just checking and trying to get to a showdown as cheap as possible seems good to me. Villain fires out a small bet of $230, and I think calling makes sense with the intention of calling some rivers. So in terms of Queen X hands, I think he'll have hands like Queen Jack, Queen 10 suited, maybe the occasional Ace Queen, and I don't think the former or always bet on rivers as well so i'd expect to see a lot of check on rivers and when i don't i'm going to be pretty skeptical about what he's got so i call and the river comes another three we do block a combo of ace three suited here and you may see people take this line with that hand i check and villain checks back i table my hand as i'm pretty sure it's closest to button who shows first and honestly i think we win relatively often but villain shows us pocket sevens for the winner if i do barrel the turn i'm not sure sevens are going to fold for one bet and i don't think i'm going to fire on the river either so in this case i don't think check calling the turn was too bad two hands later we're in the cutoff and look down at ace king again this time the offsuit variety the hijack wine drinker who seems to be getting more drunk by the minute opens to 50 i three bet once again this time to 150 dollars the hijack quickly calls and we go to a pretty miserable flop of 764 with two spades. Not a great flop, one way we can definitely consider doing a lot of checking with a good portion of our range, but we don't even get the option to as hijack donks for 150. Not much to say here, I think if I'd have known more of what this guy was up to, I'd consider even calling. Definitely if I held a spade I'd continue, but we fold and lose another part with Ace King. So an orbit or two later, I realised this guy drinking wine is getting more hammered by the second. He's now V-pipping every hand most of the time raising when the pot's unopened so he's in the cutoff and opens to $60 and we look down at ace queen in the small blind I make it $260 to go and I expect literally zero falls from him the blinds and the straddle get out of the way and lo and behold hijack throws in the core flop comes king seven four with two diamonds a very good flop for our rangers of three better and honestly a pretty reasonable flop for our hand so we've got the back door nut flush draw and we even block some of our opponent's strongest holdings such as king queen or the nut flush draw the only issue is that I think that the opponent can have basically only two cards and I'll also think he'll float a lot. So I think we have to consider the possibility of multi-barreling a drunk guy, which is not my favorite thing to do in live poker. In any case, we go for the small C-bet of $220. He thinks about it for a bit before mucking. Finally won a pot, albeit a small one, but let's see if we can continue. Not long after, we pick up Ace Queen again, and I swear with every minute that goes by, this dude gets visibly more drunk. He's been squeezing loads, min three betting versus opens, and raising literally any two cards when the pot's unopened. So he opens again to 60. We three bet him again with Ace Queen off here to $150. Falls back to him, and he's clearly had enough. He grabs a handful of chips and makes it $800 to go. So I haven't actually seen him for a bet yet. Yes, he's smashed, but I'm not sure I, I want to get in 2.5k with Ace Queen off suit. So we just mock this time. I am dying to get a spot against this guy though. And when he's in the $20 straddle, I look down at aces. Pocket fucking aces with an absolute melon in the straddle. So I open to $50. We are under the gun plus one and the next seat along calls. The button, who's a solid reg, actually thinks about it for quite a while before finally flatting. Now, usually the more people in the pot with aces, the worse it's going to be. But whenever there's a lot in the pot, this drunk guy cannot help himself but squeeze. So the small blind calls and the big blind calls as well. And I am begging this guy to find the squeeze. He announces $400 and it is music to my ears. Literally the absolute dream. So I think about it for a minute. Obviously, we're going to put in the four bet here. We make it $900 to go. The next seat quickly folds and it's back on the button. He doesn't instantly fold, which obviously I was expecting. And after a moment, he announces all in. 
Obviously not what I was expecting, but we've got aces. We will take it. The blinds get out of the way and it's back on our drunk friend and he quickly folds whatever nonsense he was squeezing with and we snap off the shove. Once or twice? Twice. 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 I have aces. Aces? Ooh. First ball's mine. So I'm always happy to run it once or twice in live games. Rag wants to run it twice, so we oblige. First board, we flop him dead on ace-3-3. Three, three, and the second board bricks out after fading some chop outs. So we scoop the biggest pot I've played in Vegas so far, over $5,000. So for what it's worth, I actually really like the reg's flat on the button. His pre-flop tank makes a lot more sense now after seeing the hand. So the straddle was likely to squeeze all kinds of shit, and even if he didn't, he still plays a disguised hand in position. The only thing I will say is that when I make it $900 pre-flop, I always have the top of my range. I'm just going to shove tens, jacks, ace, queen, and I'm pretty much only going to click like really strong hands, like aces, kings, maybe queens. Obviously, button isn't to know this, and it's still a sick cooler, but yeah, we take it. So our time at this table is unfortunately coming to an end, as we are on a must-move table, so we're going to be next to sit at the main game. There's no straddle in this hand. I think the small blind buys the button. The drunken fish in the hijack opens to 40 and the cutoff calls and we look down at ace-jack offsuit on the button. Now, normally this is a really good spot to squeeze. This hand doesn't play amazingly multi-way. So if we three bet, we sometimes win it there and then or potentially get it heads up. However, given the dynamics with our drunken buddy, I think calling is best and taking it post-flop because we don't really want to give the hijack an opportunity to four bet and force us to fold. Taking dynamics like this into account is insanely important in live poker, so if you want to learn how to adapt to live poker and crush the live games, consider checking out the Raise Your Edge live cash game course. I will leave a link in the description below, and right now you can get $100 off the course using the code WEASELLIVE. Anyway, we peel. The small blind who bought the button comes along, and so we go four way to a flop. Flop comes down ace 10 8 with a couple of clubs, and the action checks to us. I fire out a bet of around half par $80, and fortunately for us, only our drunken friend calls. Turn comes to two of spades, and Hijack decides to lead now for $140. So I cannot imagine a world where we don't have the best hand here, so you might be thinking that we should raise. I think raising is fine, but against this guy, he can have all kinds of nonsense, so I want to give him room to bluff, so I just call. River comes a solid brick, four of diamonds, and the hijack now checks. Again, I just don't see a world where we don't have the best hand, so I go for around half part again. Now, maybe I could go really small here, which is like a fun kind of exploit for when you think a player has nothing. So when you think they've got nothing and they've checked to you, you're in position, you can bet really, really tiny in order to let them spew and raise. I think it's like an ego thing. They don't want to fold versus a small bet, and obviously they can't call when they've got nothing, so sometimes they just punt it. Anyway, I do decide to bet for $320 and the hijack folds, so we pick up a nice little pot. So I ended up moving to the main game, which was no way near as good a table as the one I was just on. We did play the stand-up game though, which was fun. If you don't know how the stand-up game works, every player at the table stands up, and once you win a hand, you may take your seat. So the last player standing, i.e. the person that doesn't win a hand, then has to pay every player at the table a fee. I think in this case it was $50 per player, so if you are the last person standing, it'll cost you $350. It's a really fun game, not just for the pure degeneracy of it, but the fact that it adds new dynamics to the game and makes it even more complex, as you'll soon see. So the only real interesting hand I played in the stand-up game was with two players left standing up. So Nick Marchinson opens the cutoff and I look down at ace king of spades in the big blind. So usually a spot where we would always three bet, but the straddle is one of the two players that are left standing. So I decide to call, hoping that the straddle is going to squeeze. Some of the squeezes I saw were literally just suicidal in this game. So I think it's a really fun spot to trap. Unfortunately, the straddle just calls, so we go three way to a flop. Flop comes down 7-5-3 with a couple of spades at least, and we check. Straddle checks, and Nick, the original razor, checks behind. Turn comes the Queen of Hearts. I think about leading, but I honestly think check calling is best here. So I expect the straddle to do a lot of stabbing. They're going to be desperate to win the pot. They do stab for $120, and I think if it falls to us, we can just call and even call a ton of rivers when we brick. So on the river, they'll just check all their good showdown hands, but they'll be forced to bluff a shit ton, so I think they'll be very bluff heavy. Anyway, before it's on us, Nick puts a spanner in the works and raises to $470. So now this spot is dirt, and it highlights the problem with equity realization when you're playing out of position, especially multi-way. Now calling sucks here because the straddle is going to be forced to shove any like two pair plus, given that if they just take the pot down and win now, it isn't an issue for them. And raising feels bad when we're out of position at this stack depth. What, do we make it like a thousand to go and then call it off? 
Or do we make it a thousand and then fold if we get shoved on? I don't know. It's a grim spot. I decided to err on the side of caution and fold. And I tell Nick afterwards and he doesn't believe me. Hey, there's King of Spades. Hey, there's King of Spades. I was waiting for you to squeeze. Yeah, there's King of Spades. I've since spoken to Nick about it, and he had some fucking nonsense in the hand. I still stand by my fold, though, and he stands by his decision of calling me a nit. But what do you guys think about this? Let me know in the comments. No stand-up game hands from now, unfortunately. Under the gun opens to $60, and we look down at King Jack suited on the button. I think I'm always just calling versus under the gun here, especially when it's such a big size, as there's no straddle in this hand. The small blind who bought the button calls as well, so we go three-way to a flop. Lot comes King 10 4 Rainbow and under the gun the bats on the large side going for $130. I call the 130 and the small blind gets out of the way. Turn comes the 7 of clubs giving us a flush draw to go with our top pair and under the gun fires out an almost pot sized bet of $430. So similar to the flop I think we only really have one option here and that is to call. The hand's obviously way too strong to fold and we've got a ton of outs to improve but given it's against under the gun we don't really beat value so if we don't improve I'm going to be begging to see a check. River comes another 10, and I actually quite like this card. It takes out combinations of villains, potential value hands like King 10 suited and pocket 10s, and given the 10 of clubs isn't on the board, I can easily have 10x of clubs. So what that means is villain might even slow down with hands that beat us like ace, king, and aces. Villain does indeed slow down and check, and I think we have a pretty clear check back here. Our hand's way too thin to bet, as what hands are really going to call that's worse. So we check back, villain announces that we win, we show the goods, and scoop a four-figure pot. Next hand is a bomb pot again, so every player posts $50 and we go straight to a flop, or again, in this case, flops, as we play two boards. So the first board comes Jack 2-2, two, two, and the second comes King 10-5. We look down at Jack 9, so we've got a little piece of each. Remember, though, that ranges are infinite, as every player can have any two cards. So after under the gun checks, I check as well, and the action actually checks through. Turn comes a 10 on both boards, and under the gun checks, and I decide to bet here. There's only one 10 left in the deck, no one's showing any strength on the flop, so I lead for $220, and it folds around to under the gun who decides to call. So this player is a huge nit, so I don't think he ever has 10x because I always expect him to lead here. He's not the kind of player that's going to check call as a trap with strong hands, especially in bomb pots. So for this reason, I actually am planning on just bombing every river. It's very unlikely he's got a piece of both boards with these runouts, and it's unlikely our hand's going to be good on both boards. So I think we can just bluff him off a chop or even off the entire pot if he's got a better jack. Now, the rivers come at the case 10 on the first board and another deuce on the second. So I literally can't rep a 10 because I can't have any. And even repping a 2 is going to be difficult. So under the gun checks, and I think now with the 10 coming, I'm just going to have to check back. He's unlikely to fold a better jack now as well, so I'll just have to take what showdown I have. I check back, under the gun shows ace-king for the winner on the second board. I flip the jack-9 and take the first board. Soon after, we look down at 10-6 of diamonds in the small blind. Now, not a particularly strong hand to be playing out of position, but both the big blind and the straddle are recreationals. So I come in for the raise to $60 and both players behind call. Flop comes Jack 10 3 with two hearts. We catch a piece with middle pair. We've also got the back door flush draw. I don't want to bloat the pot unnecessarily out of position though, so I like to check. And both players check behind, so we go to a turn. Turn comes a sexy six of spades, giving us two pair. Now we want to bloat the pot, so I lead for two thirds pot for about $120. Big blind gets out of the way and the straddle comes along. River comes to jack of spades, counterfeiting our two pair. So I go for the check now as, you know, it's pretty difficult to get value from worse. And the straddle goes for about $200. So even though the jack is a bad card for our hand in that it reduces our hand strength, is it really that bad of a card in general? So in this spot, I really don't think we lose that often at all. A straddle would have to check back a jack on the flop and then bet a relatively small sizing. Or he'd have to be finding a good thin value bet with a hand like Queen Tan. I literally don't think he's capable of either, so I pretty much snap him off and he mucks. I go to muck as well, which I normally do when I don't have to show my cards, but he seems pretty interested to see what I had. So I'd say in these spots, guys, be nice to the fish. If they want to see your cards, just let them see. So I show him the 10 rather than the 6, make him feel a little bit better about his shitty bluff. A few orbits later, we look down at Ace 4 suited in the hijack. We elect to raise to $50 and only the straddle calls. Flop comes Queen 6-6 six, six with a couple of spades, so we flop the nut flush draw. Straddle checks, I go for a small c bat about one third pot here and the straddle calls. So in comes a seven of hearts and the straddle checks again. I think we've got both options here. I think we can check back and try and get to showdown, but I do think there's a little bit of merit in betting as well. 
So versus a small size on the flop, Villain is supposed to continue quite wide. So he should have some hands like pocket twos, pocket threes, and maybe even some better ace highs. Because Villain has more 6x than we do, I'm not going to go huge here. So I go for half pot and the straddle calls. River bricks out, comes the nine of clubs, straddle checks, and I think at this point he's just going to have way too much queen x, it just isn't going to fold. We might have a little bit of showdown as well with ace high, maybe he had a worse flush draw, something like king 10 or king jack of spades. So I check back and villain tables, king queen offsuit for top pair. Don't think we were getting him to fold this, so we take losing the small pot. So last hand of the evening, and it's a bit of a loose one. Under the gun plus one, who is probably the biggest fish at the table, opens to $50. The button calls, the small blind calls as well. I look down at nine, seven of clubs in the big blind and decide to call as well. Now we talked a little earlier about how difficult it can be to realize your equity multi-way when you're out of position. So I wouldn't really recommend calling here, but you know, it's getting towards the end of the day and I want to gamble. Straddle gets out of the way, so we go four way to a flop. Flop comes jack 10 five with a couple of clubs so we flop a gutter and a flush draw. Original raiser bets $100, button folds and the small blind folds so we call and go heads up. Turn comes ding ding fucking ding the four of clubs so we turn a flush. I check under the gun plus one bets $140 and I decide to just call here. I would always raise my higher flushes because we want to get as much money in against lower flushes but this guy has some button clicks in him so we will just barrel random shit. So I think calling, keeping in bluffs, but also it works for pot control on the off chance he does have a higher flush. River, unfortunately, comes a fourth club. It is the eight of clubs. I check and under the gun plus one bets $260. So like I said, this guy can have all kinds of random button clicks on the turn. He's also given us a pretty good price here. There's like 700 in the pot and he's betting 260. So with all that being said, I flick in the call pretty quickly and Villain shows the same hand, but in diamonds. He shows 97 of diamonds for a rivered straight. So obviously just a bit of a button click, but whatever, we take it and we win the last pot of the evening. So after a good solid day at the tables, we leave with little over $6,500 and we were in for 3,000, meaning a profit of $3,573 on the day.